Hi, I'm Kay Nelson. I'm the executive director of Conserve Utah Valley, and we recently held a youth and open lands conference in Spanish Fork. Um, we invited Wendy Fisher of Utah Open Lands, an expert on conservation easements, to come and speak and to give us information on bonding for conservation easements and also to just give us basic information. Preserving open space is so core for the mission of Conserve Utah Valley, and we're grateful for those who came and spoke and for those who attended. And we hope you find this information helpful in understanding the importance of uh, putting conservation easements on especially agricultural land. So I think that um, it's going to be great to be able to talk about all the different experiences that the, that the panelists have had. And then finally joining us as well is Heinrich Dieters. And he is the um, real estate, open space, and trails manager for the city of Park City. Uh, <clears throat> he's been there through numerous open space bonds, and he gets to see what happens on the other end of these lands protected, what it means for the city, uh, what it means for some of the landowners that the city works with. And one of the other things that I think is great about the panel and the reason that I felt it would be valuable to have them all assembled is they actually represent different kinds of open space bonds, some that are focused more on conservation easement acquisition and landowners, and some that are more focused on recreation um, and general open space that the city ends up acquiring. And I think that it's important to understand that one of the things we are realizing as a state, looking at our other counterpart states, is that different federal sources of funding that require matches really rely on whether or not we as a state have some funding for it. So when you've got local funding through an open space bond, you can actually leverage your dollars and take advantage of some of those federal dollars as well as private foundations and private donors that might be interested in a particular project. So that's some of the things that we're gonna cover um, through the panel discussion. I'm gonna try and keep us on task and on time. And so what I thought I would start out in with is just to have each one of the panelists describe the different open space bonds that they've been involved in. And so I thought maybe we'd start with Celeste, then go to Heinrich, and then end with Andy, and then we'll move on to our next question. But Celeste, if you wanna go ahead and unmute and talk about the bond that you've been involved in with Midway City, just give us a brief overview. Yeah, our bond is a, is actually a pretty small one. It was $5 million. And um, it's the running joke when we were trying to educate people about an open space bond and what we were trying to do. The running joke was, what are you gonna do with $5 million? Save a few driveways. Um, we have been able to leverage that money pretty dramatically, um, and we have saved almost 300 acres, and it has been so successful that our community, including folks who initially voted no the first time, when they've been able to see what we can do and the farms that have been saved, um, we've got folks uh, talking to us and are very anxious to get another open space bond on the ballot. Great. Heinrich, you want to jump in? Yeah, Wendy, thanks. Um, you know, Park City's passed uh, five open space bonds uh, in the amount of just over 110 million. Um, the first one was in 1998, and the first few, um, 10 million, 10 million, 20 million, um, really were sort of general obligation bonds. Um, to sort of temper some of the development and um, buy a lot of the Round Valley open space, if you're familiar with that in Park City. Um, so they weren't property specific. Um, our last two that we worked on, um, you know, Bonanza Flat, Wendy, what you said, property specific. I think, you know, Andy's got a lot of details on that one. And then Treasure Hill, our, our last one. So, um, you know, I think the important component of it, numerous times we've been able to, to leverage that, uh, Wendy, with you numerous times. 
uh, in your organization. Um, and, and the approval rating on those bonds has been in the high 70s. I don't, I think it's 79 point something, but you know, it, it's definitely something that the community got behind in the late 90s. And um, we've always uh, been very thankful that they've, they've passed those bonds with a, with a high percentage rating or approval rating. And Andy, I know you've been involved in a lot of different bonds, but maybe really specifically just highlight go moving forward with Bonanza um, a, as a bond, because it was the first I think that the city did that was place specific. Yeah, it, it was. And um, it was um, this was an interesting one because Bonanza, we didn't have under contract. We had a backup offer in on that, that there was a very large developer called Discovery Land Co. that had it under contract. And so we went out to the public and said, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to purchase this property. We're not sure it's going to land in our hands, but we think we have a good shot at it if the money's available. So we asked them to approve a bond that would never be, it would never be fulfilled if we weren't able to close on the property. And luckily they approved it. Uh, that particular one, I think was at about a 67% approval. Um, and the uh, public was very excited about it. And we were very excited shortly after the bond was approved for the, the deal, the first deal to fall through and us be able to exercise our backup option and complete the purchase after a whole lot of fundraising done by, uh, by Utah Open Lands and, and a lot of our partners. And I think that leads us kind of into the other, the next question. <clears throat> and I know Celeste, you're kind of wrestling with this in your community right now, but maybe starting out with Andy and Heinrich, what do you think were some of the differences between having sort of a, a play space? The, this is the open space that we're going after, Treasure Hill, Bonanza Flat versus kind of the open-ended, we're not really sure um, which open spaces we're going to be able to acquire. Did you see some marked differences? And, and I, I think along those lines, do you think that it affected your power to negotiate basic open space preservation? And then maybe we come to you, Celeste, to talk about what you're thinking about and whether you're going to target some, some things if you look at another bond. But why don't you start out, Andy and, and Heinrich, one of you want to say comment on that? Go ahead, Heinrich, you can start. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I think in its infancy back in the late 90s, I mean, Wendy, you you were there after Willow Ranch. You, you saw a lot of that in the beginning. Um, you know, for communities that are just starting, it, obviously everything new is a little bit nerve wracking, right? Celeste, you just went through it, right? Um, and there's a lot of, at some point the community understands, wow, there's a, if we don't do something, we're we're going to be in a world of hurt, right? So, and I think Park City got there pretty early, and so you know it was this open space bond that was just you know there, but there were so many properties, there was so much to save that I didn't think that it was, you know, it needed to be specific. Actually, as the community sort of matured with that, and and they realized the importance, and it was a tool in the toolbox when Treasure Hill came up from development pressure or some of the aspects and how important Bonanza Platte was. I actually, I don't think it was that different that they identified the property in the bond to go for it. It might've hurt us a little bit in negotiations possibly or something, but the will of the community, I think spoke pretty clearly through the approval ratings. Well, and Andy, maybe if you could comment on your perception of whether it affected you, you know, what you were looking at in terms of negotiation, but also I think when you did Bonanza Flat and Treasure Hill, those were some of the bigger bonds in, in terms of dollar value. And, and do you think that at all played a factor in it? I think those were easier to, to pass because they were parcels of land that the public was familiar with, that the public recreated on, loved, and to be honest, they were, they, they were under heavy development threats. And they were for projects that people weren't excited about. So Treasure in particular, for 30 years, our community grappled with that. Shortly after it was approved, it, I think we realized we bit off more than we can chew. And, um, and that's a prominent hillside for those of you who aren't familiar with it. It's a, it's a very prominent hillside that the resort's on right above Old Town. And we had an approval to put uh, essentially a million square feet of commercial on there, which is about rival to what's on Main Street. So it was just going to loom over the town and 
the town was pretty upset about that. And I think we saw that when when there was a vote for the bond, that was almost 79% approval. And it's really hard to get 79% of a community to vote to heavily tax themselves on something. They really treasured that piece of land. So it's not it's not completely necessary, but it, it, it is another tool to convince folks. And I think how you use your open space is important too. In Park City, the very first open space purchase we did is the White Barn as you drive into town, which is very iconic. And it creates this, this uh, sort of green barrier and a, a look and a feel as you come into town. And that set the tone. And people realize that if these places aren't protected, they're gonna become malls. And instead they're treasured places to, to ride your bikes and walk with your kids and watch wildlife, which is really appreciated. And, and that is such an interesting element of how the Park City bonds have really kind of moved forward, you know, within within the community and, and some of the community values. And Celeste, you know, your first bond was actually kind of very different in terms of what the community was looking for and, and what you've been able to do. It was really more conservation easement focused and landowner focused. Again, it wasn't specific to pieces of the property, but talk a little bit about that experience in terms of why you think that, that, that the community saw that as a potential good thing. Yeah, I think initially the open space bond was really perceived as a really great tool for helping us control growth, helping us to have the kind of community in 50 years that we wanted it to be. And um, I think initially that was really... Uh, the impetus towards it being passed. I think, I believe in our bond, it was a 63% approval. Um, and interestingly enough, in, in Midway, Wasatch County was also passing an open space bond. And these were both brand new bonds in this area. So this was a new concept. This was new all the way around. And their bond was $10 million. And the concern was, we're being overtaxed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then what we ended up saving, yeah, an iconic dairy, we had a, a landowner basically just come forward and say, look, if you guys are really serious about this, I've been hanging on to some land for a long time. And he was a developer by profession. And, but he could see that this mattered in our community. And when we, um, when his property was presented to the city council, and the community came out in mass to speak in favor of that. Um, and it was approved. He stood up. He was at the meeting and he stood up and he said, listen, the million dollars that was going to go towards this, this conservation easement, if you guys will promise to give, you know, to put trails around this and to continue to farm the interior of it, I'll give the million dollars back to you. So, I mean, those are the kind of success stories that we had. And um uh, and, and another project was um, a little bit of a hybrid. There's going to be some development on some part of it, but the, the part that um, is the view corridor and is what you see when you drive through town is what's going to be saved. So our community has um, seen that you, they went into it kind of blind, didn't know what a bond really was going to do, didn't know what we were going to be able to protect, didn't know how this was going to play out. And what we saved is, is is agricultural land that's very important to the community. That's great. I think maybe it'd be helpful to get into some nuts and bolts in terms of how open space bonds work. And maybe each of you could take a portion of what is the role of the city or the county government in terms of the bond, maybe talk about that bonding process. And then maybe one of the one of uh, I don't know who wants to take that first one, but a follow up question to, to that would be, um, you know, how does the public become informed? And then I'm going to hand that one to Heinrich and then maybe Andy, if you can follow up at the end. So maybe Celeste, you take the first one. What is the role of the government kind of talk about Andy, you know, can you can the county or the city advocate for a bond? you know, talk about the, the for and against letters, those sorts of things. But Celeste, why don't we start with what is kind of that bond process look like for a city or a county? Yeah, we had to kind of do a deep dive pretty quickly to find out there's timelines and the pro and, and con language that has to be provided for the ballot. Um, once, once the city council approves putting a bond on the ballot, then we can't use city resources to... Um, 
advocate for or against it, right? But we can assist with things like um, we can participate in town meetings. We can help folks understand, for example, our little $5 million bond um, on a home that's valued at about a million dollars. The property taxes from Midway on that home are $318. And um, the bond payment on that is going to be is $98. It's, those are annual amounts. Now, obviously, there's other property taxes, there's school taxes, and there's other things you know, on that tax bill. But Midway specific, um, the bond $98 payment for a whole year, people are seeing, oh, okay, that is not that much. That's a couple dinners out that I might have to give up, right? And so we can help educate people as to what the amount would be and how that would play out on their tax bill. Um, and we answer questions. We're happy, you know, that's completely allowed and completely legal to answer anyone's questions. And Heinrich, how else have you seen the public get informed with respect to what's happening with the bond, whether it's a specific piece of property or, you know, just in general, what are some of the ways that the public gets informed? Well, you know, the bonding process, state code sort of dictates how the bonding process, and Andy, maybe you can speak about, uh, you know, the resolutions that have to be passed, the, the, the Celeste, you said the, the, the pro and con, I know that the city, we send out a, a voter in for, or a open space bond pamphlet that outlines everything. Um, you know, I, I gotta tell you, I, I spent a little bit of time today on the Conserve Utah site. Um, you know, your partners uh, going out and um, talking to people in, in their living rooms uh, and understanding what those are really play a huge role. I looked at the the list of projects there for Conserve Utah, if I'm saying that right, if it, I'm, I apologize if I'm getting that wrong, but you know, the, the Bridal uh, Veil vale Falls, um, some of the canyons there, Utah Lake. I mean, you know, it's really a lot of the stakeholders, uh, whether they're nonprofits for recreation or open uh, space, even some of the, um, you know, the stores in town that, that you know, they, they, you know, they're up in Park City. It's it's a lot of you know we're a resort community, so a lot of the stores, you know, the bike shops and things like that, you know, understand the importance of those. And there's almost like a buzz around town that you know, hey, look, we have this opportunity to maybe protect this property like Bonanza Flat. But really, your stakeholders are a huge, you know, way to get to get the word out. And Andy, I know that Heinrich asked you to talk a little bit about kind of some of the the. the legal machinations of it, but I think also maybe hit on on the bond language and 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 how you guys have looked at specifically crafting your bond language you, as you go out, because that becomes a, a really critical element at, at the end of the day. Before I do, Wendy, I'd like I'd like to mention one thing that I think is important in this whole process, which is um, each time we've done a bond, uh, Park City has created a citizen committee, which is comprised of a variety of folks, folks that represent the ag ag side of things, the development side of things, environmentalists, um, you got an elected official or two, you've got some business people, and that committee re reviews the open space purchases and makes recommendations to the council. And so you end up with about 10 highly respected citizens that are very educated on these issues and very committed to these issues. And they sort of become your, gr your ground soldiers, so to speak, when you're advocating for these things and educating the public, they, they get out there and they help you. And when you're gearing up to do a bond, it is fair game ahead of time to, to talk about why it's important. You know, use your role to say the reason we're putting this on the ballot is because we think it has these positive impacts on our community. And and even once uh, once you hit August and you it determine it's going to be on the ballot, you can no longer use city resources, but you can still work with your partners and be there for informational purposes. I know Wendy on on Bonanza and also on. On, uh, the treasure in the Armstrong Snow Creek Pastures, Utah Open Lands was holding grassroots house parties. I came to many of those to help explain the details of the bond and put people at ease. And then we also, in, in our town, there's so much enthusiasm over Bonanza, our leadership class took it on as a project and they decided to help educate the public. So it, it really can become a community effort where you get these people out there that are your ambassadors, so to speak, that are promoting this and, and all the benefits from different angles. That's great. Um, and I think I want to come back to some of the things you talked about with respect to, to kind of the ranking criteria 
that you guys all end up using and the citizen committees, because I think across the board, Midway, <coughs> Park City, and um, uh, many other communities that have passed bonds, they do rely on a, a citizen committee to help with kind of a ranking process as these different conservation easements or open spaces come through. But before we turn to that, I was wondering if you guys could speak to the role of conservation easements, obviously, as a land trust organization, Utah Open Lands is, is a little bit biased towards the value and the tool of a conservation easement. I see you're laughing, Heinrich. That's great. <laughs> um, but, but you know, maybe speak from your perspective. And obviously, there are some pros and cons. Um, maybe I'll jump to you first, Celeste, because your bond primarily focuses on acquiring conservation easements as opposed to acquiring the fee title. So we'll start there and then we'll follow up with Heinrich's laughter after that. And I have to apologize. I My uh, public works guy had, was texting me with an issue in the snow plowing. So, so what you would like me to speak to is? <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, so just maybe the role of conservation easements. Why has the city decided that that was the route you wanted to take? Because really the bond has paid for the purchase of conservation easements. So the farmers and ranchers continue to own their land. Yeah. Um, but, but what was some of the thinking behind that, even with that individual that donated the fee title of the property um, at the end of the day, you know, there was also a conservation easement component. So maybe speak from your perspective of, you know, what does that mean for the landowner? And why, from a community perspective, did you find that a value? Yeah, we, I, I, as we discussed it, and again, we're so, we're the babies in this is in terms of timing and, and we're still pretty new at it, but it appeared to us that it made sense to have conservation easements so that the city wasn't uh, in charge of taking care of some properties, right? We, uh, having conservation easements meant that farmers could continue to farm. And that's really the, um, that's really become the objective for us It as we're getting into this. That's what we're finding out farmers need. They wanna keep their land. They wanna keep farming. Their kids wanna keep farming. It's generational. It's not um, something that's going to go away. I think that's a misnomer. Um, the kids wanna keep farming the land and they can't afford to without a, an influx of, of some cash and a conservation easement gives them that. So with the property that ended up being donated to the city, fee title outright, we chose to put a conservation easement on that so that a, a city council down the road can't decide, hey, let's sell this. We really don't need this conservation easement anymore. Um, we wanted to put belt and suspenders on that, keeping that a agricultural land. Um, and it's it's worked so well for us that that's what we're going to continue doing. And Heinrich, you were smiling and laughing a little mm -hmm. bit. Maybe you can talk about the pros or the cons that you see with respect to the conservation easement. What well, is, what is, I, how have you guys gone about it? Well, I think we've got about 25 now. Uh, I counted, I had to do a website the other day and I counted them up. I think we're up to 25. You know, Celeste touched base on, you know, there's going to be certain times where, right, I'm not a farmer. We, we want to preserve agricultural property, right? It makes sense for the conservation easement. Obviously, there's tax benefits to that landowner. You know, it's it's of a lower value than paying fee um, for it, you know, so there's a lot of just sort of advantages there, you know, but, but Celeste also touched base on you know, someone told me a long time ago, and it might have been you, Wendy, you know, there's always there's always a next great idea, uh, you know, and councils and government turnover and staff like myself, you know, turnover. I think I'm 15, 17 years or so, but, you know, it does turn over and you forget the intent and you forget the relationships and stuff. And the third party, I think, adds, you know, a lot of confidence in a, in a nation that has maybe not so much confidence in government right now. Um you know, and, you know, keeping the annual monitoring, uh, you know, the third party working with, you know, Wendy, how many volunteer days have we had where we have different groups up, you know, and it keeps sort of that, you know, community awareness and partnership and, um, you know, confidence in the, the entire open space um, sort of movement. That's why I think we've done five and we've been successful with five because we haven't messed up. And a lot of that is because we've put conservation easements on a lot of the part, uh, the properties and we have great partners. 
So all good. Wow, no cons. Okay, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'm personally a huge fan of conservation easements, and I th I think they're important. When you when you purchase a property, you make a promise to the community about what you're going to do. When you use open space money, you make a promise to the property owner that often the legacy and the relationship is super important, and you do it with intent. And that intent is to live within your footprint. And I, I often heard from, uh, you know, there were certain city staff and city attorneys and folks that really don't want you to tie your hands with legal agreements with third parties because it can complicate things. But that complication is intentional. Um, you, you have to be very careful when you purchase land and you put conservation easement on it that that is your intent. And if that is your intent, you don't want future councils to come along and undo that and break all the promises and commitments you made to the parties. And so what I recommend is, is we, we started to realize that, that there are important pieces of land to preserve for whether it's view shed or recreation or, or ecological purposes, but sometimes there are also other par parcels on the edge of those that may be good for housing or may be good for a public works need or something. So we, we as sort of open space 3.0 for us as we figured out how the funding is appropriate and how the parsing out of these properties is appropriate that maybe we can carve off pieces that don't need to be preserved for um for sort of the endless community needs while preserving the critical ones and and you can be nuanced on that but it's important you be honest and you you really codify that in a conservation easement up front right i think that one of the things i know just from a land trust perspective as heinrich and has mentioned, you know, getting some of the nonprofit partners involved. There are commitments um, and there are promises that get made to donors. So that does become a component, I think, when you have the leveraging that can occur um, with some of these open space bonds. But to that end, maybe each of you could talk a little bit about the leveraging that has been able to, to, to happen through some of the, the open space bonds. And so Celeste, I am gonna start with you again to maybe talk about the leveraging that you feel has happened in your community. You know, obviously there are examples like the, the Albert Kohler Dairy Project. Um, Heinrich, you might talk about the leveraging that occurred from the Armstrong um, Snow Ranch Pastures and the barn. And then Andy, maybe you could round us out talking about the, the intense uh, campaign to raise the additional funds for for Bonanza. So Celeste, let's start with you. Yeah, with the uh, dairy here, it, it's technically in the county, um, and but it's on Midway's boundary. And Midway was pretty specific um, in the, I love that you guys are 3.0, we're like 0.5 with this first round, but what we, we made some very specific language when we passed this bond, our bond language, and that the property had to be within Midway or Midway's annexation boundary, because one of account, one of, well, two of our council members in particular really felt strongly that the money that was being accumulated from Midway residents should be used in Midway. And, um, one of the reasons, and, and the dairy is in our annexation boundary, so it counted, but one of the reasons it became so appealing was the high level of leveraging. So um, Lee Ray McAllister funding was involved. There were there was the NR, NC, NRCS. NRCS, so many acronyms in the government world. Um, there was private funding, and, and the family was so passionate about the they really contributed a lot on their side. They they left a lot of money, if, especially if you compare it with what they could have gotten from a developer. So I have to include that in the leveraging component. And Midway, you know, we we put up, a, I, I believe it was a million dollars. Wendy, you correct me if I get any of this wrong, but um, it was easily a $10 million project. So, so for us, that's a one to 10. And we had hoped that we could leverage at least up to three times. So all of our projects, the leveraging has been expansive because of the, you know, the, the type of projects they were. 
Heinrich, why don't you talk to, take us through? I got to just, yeah. before I leave that all together, we couldn't have done that without the expertise of Utah Open Lens, I have to say. When you're brand new into this, you don't know what you're doing, and Utah Open Lens does. So, kudos. Well, thanks. Appreciate so that. Time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you and ask the same thing, because, Wendy, if I get any of these numbers wrong, you'll let me know. Um, you know, a lot of these, probably my favorite thing about my job is actually getting to know or continuing to know, you know, the old ranching families that the, the families that have been there, you know, since the dawn of time, I like to say the Armstrong family is, is, is one, you know, in Park City, um, you know, and it, it has really just been a leverage, you know, with that entire family. I think we did the first Armstrong about 135 acres, Wendy, and this is where I'm going to need you to like, right. That was, I think 5 million we did on that. It was a big piece of property. Um, you know, to be honest, it would have been an absolutely fantastic for all the ski people, you know, like another base for Vale Resort. I'm not saying that, right. But I mean, the location that it was like, it, it could have been another base, you know, there was a lot of development pressure. So, you know, I think we got that for a song and there was a lot of, um, you know, um, that, that family definitely provided a lot of don donation in that value. Um, we did, then later on, we did Snow Ranch Pastures, which I recall was, was much more expensive uh, there was like a six million. They donated three million. I'm gonna get this wrong, Wendy, but you're nodding your head, right? There's a lot of value. There's a lot of donations that came in, you know. But probably more importantly, right smack dab in the middle of those properties, is this is a beautiful red iconic barn. It's about 11 acres that that's on in the homestead. It's, it's an absolutely fantastic piece of property, which 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 was donated, as I recall, you know, a conservation easement on that. And Wendy, right? I got that in yep. your whole that aspect. Um, you know, so again, like the million dollars, Celeste, you know, the gentleman standing up, you know, you, 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 you build these relationships with these great families, you know, and, um, you know, they see how it, important it is in the legacy associated and there's a lot of aspects and, and, and just real quick, Wendy, maybe one you weren't thinking of as, as the manager of the property going on. You know, we have been extremely successful getting whether there's trailhead grants or trail grants or, you know, the 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 opportunities for get, getting grants for like ecological restoration projects and stuff. You know, when when communities or boards that provide grants see that like, A, you can serve to this, you know, with bond money and through a community effort with donations, like it just it all builds on itself and and you, you can really leverage a lot of. Uh, money and future grants on on the properties. Yeah, absolutely. I think there was a, a 3.3 .3 million that the city put into Armstrong Snow Ranch Pastures. 2.7 million was donated was was brought by community members, foundations, and then I think there was another six million dollar at least contribution from the family. So thank you. I knew I, knew I got those a little bit wrong, but thank <laughs> it's all you. good. Okay. And, and Andy, I think one of the largest fundraising kind of conservation um, efforts really that was taken on, I think, to date in the state of Utah really re revolved around Bonanza Flat. Um, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit about what took place there between the bond and then, you know, the additional and the gap and, and how that all came together. Yeah, Wendy, you and I spent a lot of time together on that one. Um, for those that aren't familiar with Bonanza Flat, it's neither in Park City nor Summit County. It's actually on our boundary, right on the edge of Salt Lake, Summit, and Wasatch County, inside Wasatch County. And it's a key watershed for uh, much of the Salt Lake Valley. And so it's a, it's a very important piece of land, and Park City certainly wanted to preserve it, but we also felt like it wasn't just ours to preserve, that it's a community treasure, and we wanted to see participation in that. And so uh, Wendy and myself and a few others went on the road and spoke with Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, uh, Sandy, Metro Water, uh, Midway, uh, Wasatch County, I believe, um, Heber City, it talked to many of the entities impacted, and they all they all contributed in different ways, in different amounts, what felt appropriate to them. 
but it took a lot of education about the importance of the watershed up there, how valued the recreation and ecosystem is. And um, we, we definitely could not have done that without a, a land trust like Utah Open Lands that's a trusted partner there helping foster those relationships and setting up those meetings and, and getting us the opportunity. And I, I will say when you, when you wanna make an open space purchase, if you as a city or a governmental entity try to do it by yourself, pretty much you're not going to leverage anything. You're just going to pay what the what the price is. And if you're lucky, there's a relationship there that you can maybe get a decent value. But my experience has been whenever a land trust takes lead on the negotiations, they are going to leverage um, both the fact they're a nonprofit and their relationships and their donor base and things to, to make it a much better overall deal for all parties involved. It's their expertise. Uh and 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 I I couldn't agree more. Um, but also I appreciate the kudos for Utah Open Lands. But I think it is you know in that effort there were eleven different nonprofits that we coalesced together. Um, you know because those partnerships are important. And I think beyond the the cities and the counties that contributed to it, there were also thirty five hundred individuals um, that contributed. And some of it was, you know, ten dollars. Some of it was three hundred thousand dollars, but it was all based on, you know, the insurance of protecting the resource. And I think also part of that education that Andy you spoke of with respect to helping folks realize this does affect the watershed. This this affects um, the canyons. This affects. Um, places that we really enjoy playing. That if they're not protected, you know, they go away. Um, I think that that the next thing I want to kind of focus in here on the few minutes that we have left is, Andy, you brought up earlier having this um, citizen committee that you put together to really look and evaluate the various different projects, because there's going to be interest from various different landowners, especially if it's just a general open space. But even with respect to Bonanza, putting together a group of, of stakeholders that could help with looking at how you wanted to craft the conservation easement moving forward. What would really, I think, be beneficial for folks is to hear kind of how did each of you come up with your, your rank, ranking process or your criteria? Were there specifics? Were there a percentage of donation that landowners might make that made a specific project potentially rise to the top? Um, did it have to have certain conservation values, certain recreation values, certain farming values? Did it have to be on the entry quarter? Or what were some of the things that went into that ranking criteria? Um, and, and Heinrich, you nodded your head first, so we're going to start with you. Yeah, I honestly, uh, Wendy, I think you were in the room when we did ours. We spent a good, I bet we spent eight months working on our most recent one with COSAC. Now, that's been a few years ago, but um, you know, development pressure obviously ranks high, you know, augmenting is just existing open space, um, you know, the ecological uh, values, the recreational components. I think, again, on the website for Conserve Utah, I saw that um, uh, the Bonneville Shoreline Trail, I know that there's a lot of effort being put into sort of protecting property or, or aspects like that. Um, you know, and, and so there were numerous, numerous criteria that went through it. Uh, there were different conservation easements uh, that, that, you know, we considered, uh, and then even uses. This is when we're looking at properties, passive or active recreation, certain aspects, um, you know, but I think, uh, and happy to share, you know, I think a lot of that, for anybody interested on in some of the things, but um, I think what's been interesting over the years that I've done it is, you um, you know, you go through these processes, it's very important, you rank them, you look at the, the qualities, you make the recommendations to council, but, you know, your number one might not always happen. Sometimes, you know, when you're doing a open space, you never know who walks in the door, um, you know, so you have to be nimble. And when you have those bond dollars that are there sometimes, you know, you can, and then you can leverage and, and you can, you can preserve property, you know, in a very efficient manner. Um, you know, because opportunities to, like this, you know, sometimes you just never see them coming and they might be ranked seventh on your list, but they turn into like, you know, a great piece of property that, that further augments other open space and, and leads you to another path. So, you know, it's, 
it's having that ranking system is important, but you know, it's, it's, you got to keep talking to the community and keep the door open um, to meet with landowners for opportunities like that. And Celeste, how has it been kind of going through the ranking process? Um, you've got a Midway Open Space Advisory Committee, um, you know, very similar to, to some of the things that Andy and Heinrich talked about. Um, but what are some of the things that that committee has been looking at when they when they go through their ranking of the different properties to to provide some fairness in the process? Yeah, and and I I just really want to underscore what Heinrich said. This this was this is not an easy thing to do. It took this committee months and months and months, hours and hours and hours. We tried to even come up with the definition of open space. You know, it, it's it's very difficult. And so they came up with a process that has worked incredibly well with us. And like, like Heinrich, I am happy to share any of these forms or anything with anyone who's interested, but the, um, you know, we have a notice of intent. So a landowner comes in and says, you know, we, we want to become a part of this. And there's some basic information that um, they have to respond to. And that gives this committee a chance to find out, um, you know, how, how, close could it is it to being developed or is it a view corridor or an agricultural parcel of land and those kinds of you know and what's interesting is we wanted to do this based on what it was the community wanted but we couldn't get a, a cohesive definition of what that was so it and so we had to just say okay all of these are viable and then and then what became in terms of ranking what became important ultimately for us was, okay, they filled out this paperwork, the committee has looked at the property, um, we've, we've looked in, you know, we, we find out first of all, if they're, you know, working with a conservation group, because that's very important. We don't have the expertise in man hours. And if this landowner is unwilling to work with the conservation group, that could that's going to put them on a back burner for our committee. Um, but ultimately, what really mattered was, okay, these guys are serious. They are continuing to move forward. They are aggressive. They, we, and, and let's face it, everything in Midway is under threat of development. So everyone ranks the same place on that one. Um, and, and so we just, you know, they're, they're moving forward. They're serious. So we're moving forward and we're serious. Um, those initial forms are incredibly helpful. I think they're inc uh, incredibly helpful for our committee as well as the landowner. The landowner can then see, oh, my land is going to be a priority because it has these things or I can't check any of these boxes. So I may have to reconsider what it is I'm asking for. Um, and, and my open space committee um, was very much involved in getting the bond on the ballot. And then they were very much involved in the process and making the recommendations to city council on which projects to move forward with. And so and by the way, they've got a ton of lawyers on that committee and it still worked. So there you go. <laughs> so leap, leaping from that, maybe kind of round us out here, um, Andy, because I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so we talk a little bit about the process, for example, with COZAC and, and how they would make recommendations to the city council and, and how you saw that as a council member and then also as a mayor in terms of, of, of what that did um, for you as a council. Well, we, we deeply valued their input and I think we, we almost always followed it. Um, what I will say, I, I think that ranking exercise is, is absolutely critical for the committee to spend those months debating the values of open space, better understanding it from everybody's perspective. I think they, you know, they represent a microcosm of your community. So getting their arms wrapped around what the priorities are, are key. But at the end of the day, it is just an exercise. And I think we, a lot of these open space opportunities sort of pop up on us. And um, I look at our two biggest ones, I think Treasure and Bonanza Flat, and neither one of them were even on the ranking list because we didn't think we were going to get that opportunity. And when it did, you know, each one of them we thought was the opportunity of a lifetime, and they happened to come within two years of each other. Um, and then some of the other ones we worked with, like Clark Ranch and I think Snow Creek Pastures, I'm not sure those were top five 
even, but they, you know, there's a lot of timing that comes to this, that, that relationships will be fostered over years. And when the landowner is ready to sell for whatever reason, you need to be ready to move. And so I think it's important to have that criteria. It's important to share with your community and understand it, but you also need to be ready to move, understanding that you, you, you can't, it won't fall in the order that you ideally set it up. Um, and, um, did I answer your question there, Wendy, though? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you, you, you definitely did in terms of, you know, the fact that the advisory committee does a lot of the legwork for the city council in terms of looking at that ranking, but that also there's probably... I think um, I, I put a finer point on it, and I know I've heard this from so many different communities. Certainly, we don't want to go out and target any individual landowner's piece of property because everybody has their own private property rights, and and they're going to fulfill and 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 do whatever they want to. Some will want to exercise the private property right to preserve their land. Some may want to develop it. So being ready in the event that they're considering possible conservation, as you mentioned, Andy, I think is really really important. But I think that other element that you're speaking to is in every community. And Celeste mentioned it as well. There are those standout properties that you know that if it were lost, it would change the character of the community. It would have an impact. Um, and sometimes it's several properties. Sometimes it's a general area. Um, and so being able to, to have that kind of distilled through a committee process that can help to advise um, the council uh, or the commission, um, whatever it may be, I think is is kind of what, what you guys have found in Park City. And I know that we're holding Good. questions and answers. I'm actually able to see John Benyon. Should we wrap this up and move yes. on? To yes, okay. So we're gonna wrap this up. I think we are holding some question and answers until later. Um, before you speak, Wendy, on directly on conservation easements, I'm going to say just a couple of words. I'm looking at this audience and uh, we sent, the invitation as Conserve Utah Valley, we sent this invitation to city officials, every city official in the whole county and uh, county officials. And what I'm seeing before me is mostly people who have been out in the weather, <laughs> uh, people who are who probably left, uh, probably fed their cow, cows first and their horses and came here after doing that. And so as we shift the conservation easements, we we need we will shift to what might be of more concern directly to you you guys. I don't I think that what we've heard is so important because unless your city officials are like these city officials, if you can get these city officials on your side is the way I should have put it. If you can get city officials on your side, then you have an easier road to make a conservation easement. It isn't just an individual fight. It's a group of people getting together. One one partner is the city or the county, and uh, I think uh, Brandon is very interested in this possibility of open lands. And the the other individual, the other entity is uh, funding sources other than bond city bonds or federal government. And so it's a cooperative effort between city officials and and you as landowners. But now Wendy's going to talk more directly to what you came to hear, which is actually about conservation easements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I want to um, applaud and thank my panelists for, for participating. What you'll hear when I start to talk about the conservation easements is quite frankly where, or, where communities and landowners have had the greatest success in preserving meaningful open space, meaningful agricultural landscapes. It has definitely come with some help from the federal programs and even from the state Lee Ray McAllister program, which Celeste nodded to. But if you don't have matching funds within your county, it makes it incredibly hard. And that's one of the reasons that we wanted to talk and start out with this bond process and understand that it is a lengthy process. It takes time, but it is definitely something to be considered because it does become a necessary part to get to some of the matching funds that are required if you want to purchase a conservation easement. So with that, <clears throat> 
I am going to invite, I know that not all of our presenters can stay on until the end. You're certainly welcome to, but I'm just going to move right on in the interest of time, and I am going to share my screen, and I will um, begin my presentation um, on Utah Open Lands and um, conservation easements and what we do as an organization and land conservation. So I oftentimes start out talking about Utah Open Lands by telling people what our greatest hits are. Um, and Utah Open Lands worked really cooperatively with Utah County on the conservation easement that is now protecting Bridal Veil Falls. And as Heinrich mentioned earlier, Conserve Utah Valley was a vital partner in rallying community support to ensure that the county council or the county commission, and obviously that the public was aware of what needed to take place to ensure that Bridal Vale Falls was protected. Other properties that we've worked on include the Redford Family Elk Meadows Preserve, the Redford Family Nature and Wildlife Preserve. I highlight those because those are in um, Utah County, and also the Redford Family uh, Elk Meadows Preserve also protects that wonderful trail to Stewart Falls, that hiking trail that we all thought was public, but now it's protected forever. Bonanza Flat, we talked about. Well, Albert Kohler, we talked about. Armstrong Snow Ranch Pastures. And then one of my favorite ones that was one of the first agricultural easements in the Salt Lake Valley um, was the Gene and Dean Whedon Farmland Preserve. But all told, the organizations protected about 64,000 acres working with landowners. And it's all a voluntary process. Even when you're looking at some of these bonds, um, this is not any sort of condemnation. This is all a voluntary process that we work with, with the landowners who basically wanna exercise their private property right to preserve their land. We all know that we have choices with respect to the land that we own. But for some landowners, the legacy that they wanna leave for the next generation is the family farm. What they want to leave for the next generation is the places that they want to play. Um, and that's what a land trust and conservation easements can help do. So just to give you a little bit of a brief history and some, some background, Utah Open Lands was established in 1990. Um, but I was part of that establishment of Utah Open Lands in 1990. And I think it's pertinent to know that I grew up in Utah County. And I used to ride my horse um, through the orchards. I did have permission. I just want to make that clear from the outset. Um, we, I would ride my horse through the orchard and orchards and up onto the foothills of Timpanogos. Um, and for me, growing up, I think that was one of the main things that was really, really vital um, to to my development as I was growing up. I think that what shocked me was the fact that my horse outlived all of the orchards that I used to ride through. And so that's one of the reasons that I became committed to um, working uh, for a land trust and helping to create Utah Open Lands. It was the first local land trust in the state. All land trusts are 501c3 public charities, but they have a special designation under the federal code that enables us to hold conservation easements. I'm not gonna get into the details of that. I can certainly help you out with that. It's also on our website if you wanna understand more about it. But as Utah Open Lands was going through the process to receive our public charity status to be able to hold conservation easements, we actually made agricultural preservation part of a really fundamental part of our mission, which actually became really critical later because um, agricultural lands are actually part of a broader ca category under that federal code. So we felt it was really important to call that out. In Utah, actually conservation easements are pretty young. Um, 1985 was the, the enabling statute here in the state of Utah. In 1999, there was a Utah Critical Lands Task Force. And that really became the genesis for the Lee Ray McAllister Critical Lands Fund that has now really become, I think, um, a great state vehicle for protecting our working landscapes. That's really a lot of the focus that um, that particular fund has been able to absorb now that it's really working under the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. 
Um, and then well, the first community open space bond was in Park City in 2000. And I think it's just interesting to look at the number of communities throughout our state that actually have passed open space bonds. And if you think of places like Draper City, their whole entire Corner Canyon trail system, which has been a huge quality of life element for the community, was under the threat of significant development, but would not have been protected without a bond. The very first bond they passed was specific to Corner Canyon. But I wanted to speak really quickly, I think about, and this is a picture of the Armstrong Snow Ranch pastures, about really why we protect open space. Because I think a lot of times people look at protecting open space as potentially locking in the fate of the land forever. And I think that what we don't realize is that actually in protecting these open spaces, we are preserving possibilities. We're preserving the possibility of being able to feed ourselves. We're preserving the possibility of being self-sufficient and self-reliant. We're preserving our ability really um, to maintain a quality of life that at the end of the day really is part of our economic vitality. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of us certainly are in situations in our communities where we're continuing to rely on people coming and visiting our communities and enjoying some of the amenities of those communities and spending and leaving the dollars there um, in order to sustain our economy. But there's another element of open space preservation that we have seen borne out in study after study after study. And we saw it again when we were going through the open space bond process in Wasatch County, because there we actually did a study to determine really, is there a quantifiable way you can get to the quanti quanti quantifiable value of open space? And in fact, open space is a net revenue. Um, for every dollar that you generate in residential development, it actually costs a community between a dollar 13 and a dollar 65. For every dollar in agricultural lands, even those under Greenbelt, it actually it only costs a community 65 cents. I like to say that that's because cows don't go to school, right? When we have those residential developments, we also have the services that come along with them. And I bring that up because really what we're talking about is it's about balance. It's about finding those things that are so critical to us as a community and helping those farmers and ranchers that actually are a net revenue to the community to help the community thrive and to help them thrive. That's part of what conservation easements can do. So let's talk a little bit about land conservation, the decision that goes on, the process and the result. And we heard a lot about how it happens from a government perspective. And now really what I would like to focus on is to talk about how it happens from a landowning family perspective. I've worked with a lot of landowners over the past 33 years. And the thing that's been really interesting to me is that as much as the families are incredibly different, so much of the decision that they make is really very similar. They're typically gathering around a kitchen table and they're talking with everybody about what the future legacy is gonna be of their land, of the, the 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 generational connection that they have to the to the property, they're usually talking about how brother so and so and sister so and so doesn't necessarily want to work the farm anymore, but the other brothers do. And so, how do you compensate for those that want to continue to be on the land versus those that might want to be moving on? And so. I think the first thing that we look at with respect to um, landowners and going through this process, and Celeste had brought it up as part of their bonding process, but even when you work through any sort of these federal programs, you really wanna make sure that you start working with a qualifying entity under 170H of the IRS code. And the reason for that <clears throat> is that oftentimes becomes a, a huge element to any of the funding sources that you're going to look at. And also if you wanted to make a partial contribution of the conservation easement value, which we'll talk about why that's 
important when we talk about funding in a moment, you're going to want to work with an entity that qualifies under 170H. Um, and there are some parallels between um, Utah's enabling statute, but basically a qualifying conservation entity under 170H is a land trust like Utah Open Lands, again, a 501c3, but that has that extra qualification of having the resources and the commitments to sustain the conservation purpose of the land. Um, it can be a local government. Um, I think you've heard a little bit from the folks on the panel that sometimes the local governments want to have that third partner um, to help in some of the decisions that come up down the road to help lock in that charitable intent um, that was part of the process. And, you know, during rash times to maybe stay the course and ensure that the land is protected because conservation easements in order to qualify for many of the different funding options or to qualify under 170H, they have to be in perpetuity, which is a long time. They can also be a national land trust. You have national land trusts like the Trust for Public Lands. Um, there's an organization called the Conservation Fund that had been doing a lot of work around Camp Williams and um, in the uh, town of Eagle Mountain and that area as a buffer to Camp Williams. Um, there's the Nature Conservancy. There's the Trust for Public Lands. Um, so those are some of your national land trusts that you could work with. And then you can actually work with the state any sort of government entity like that. Um, and the, the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food has easement specialists, so they can help you move through the process. Um, but they're also a qualifying conservation entity, um, as is the Division of Nat Natural Resources. So there are a lot of um, entities that you can work with. Um, Utah Open Lands happens to be a nationally accredited land conservation organization, which means that we've met the highest standards of the over 13 um, uh, standards and I think 88 practices that go into ensuring a sound land conservation transaction. Um, so that's something that we bring to the table um, that we think is valuable, but we also work with a number of our different partners from government entities to others um, just to help to share our knowledge and to ensure that the conservation easement works, you know, for the landowner. But as a landowner, instead of trying to get all of that information yourself, really turning to a land trust organization, or again, one of these state entities that's working on it, there's a lot of information that they can provide to you right up front. Um, and it's all basically free of charge. I have members that support what our organization does so that we can be a resource for the landowners who want to protect their land in perpetuity. So what exactly is this conservation easement that you would be contemplating for your property? Well, you know, the definition of a conservation easement, and I believe actually that this comes from um, the uh, the uh, uh, Farmland Assessment Act under the state of Utah is, I believe, where I got this definition. But basically, it's an encumbrance on land for the purpose of preserving areas um, in a scenic, natural, or open space condition. This includes recreation, cultural, wildlife, agricultural purposes. It is a legally binding agreement, and it is at vol entered into voluntarily by the landowner and the qualifying conservation organization, like a land trust. Um, Really, what I see conservation easements as when I talk to a landowning family is fundamentally it's a visioning document. If you think about um, the planning and the zoning and all of the things that go into subdividing and developing a piece of property, um, that takes a lot of time, it takes engineers, it takes all sorts of different opinions and thought processes. And doing a conservation easement is, is in some ways similar. You're looking at the forward vision of your particular property. And you're looking at what the legacy is that you want to leave. And you're considering all sorts of things about permitted uses, how you want to continue to use the land, and things that you don't want to see happen on the property. And fundamentally, what a conservation easement does is in order to protect those conservation purposes, the scenic values or the agricultural values, it basically takes the property rights of development and subdivision and some of those things that would defeat the agricultural purpose or defeat the scenic natural open or wildlife value. And you take those those development sticks or those development rights and kind of tie them up in a little bow 
And those are the things that are get, get set aside in the conservation easement that can't be done on the property. And they are enforced by Utah Open Lands. We ensure that that development doesn't take place in perpetuity. Um, because again, what we're doing is we're protecting this land in favor of those conservation purposes that we talked about by restricting what development can take place on the property. Now, I wanna be really clear when you place a conservation easement on your property, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are restricting every single thing in terms of development. If you're a farmer and you're farming your landscape, it's probably a good idea if you have a house there that you can be right there watching the, the livestock, going out and tending to your fields. So oftentimes there's what we call kind of a building envelope. There may be loafing sheds or a barn that might be central to the agricultural um, protection that needs to happen. All of those things can be negotiated into a conservation easement, but clearly, cookie cutter, quarter acre subdivision is not gonna qualify when you're trying to protect that, that particular conservation resource. And I think one of the things to think about is when we look at protecting land for a specific conservation resource, sometimes I'll get the question of, I have a half an acre in my backyard and I see a deer there every once in a while. Protecting it for the habitat for the deer, if it's only a half an acre and everything around it gets developed, probably is not going to meet the conservation purpose test for wildlife protection. So those are some of the things that the land trust can help you look at as a landowner, as you're considering a conservation easement, and what you might be looking at with respect to the different parameters that you want to be able to live with. What do you need to use the property for? What are the things that you are going to restrict? And again, fundamentally, a lot of that comes down to restricting all out subdivision and development. A conservation easement runs with the land in perpetuity. Um, each conservation easement really is specific to the landowner and the land itself specific to those conservation values. For example, if you're protecting a scenic view shed, it's actually not what you can see looking out from your property. It's what is the view shed from the public road or um, from some public trail? What is it that has that public benefit of that scenic view shed? And then in those particular instances, if you did want to retain the right to put in a loafing shed, you'd have to make sure that you maintained the scenic pastoral view shed. So those are the kinds of things that become very specific and very tailored to the particular landscape itself. And then also the landowner and the landowning family, who is going to be the next in line that's going to be working that landscape. And oftentimes we get asked if we can just send out a template conservation easement. And we really shy away from that because no property is the same. And even though there are similar issues that landowning families face, no landowner is going to be the same. And so we really want to stress and emphasize that conservation easements take, take time. In fact, I've often said they don't happen overnight. They really do take months and months of planning. Um, the land remains in the hands of the family. So basically, when you think about land ownership, we oftentimes understand that water rights can be separate or separated from the land itself and it becomes an interest. Well, a conservation easement is essentially an interest in that particular property, but it allows the landowners to continue to own the land and to continue to uh, farm it. They can even pass it on to the next generation or even sell it down the road. But the terms of the conservation easement remain on the title and they remain intact on the property in perpetuity. I think as Celeste mentioned, you know, one of the values that they've looked at as a community is you ha already have these great stewards of agricultural landowners who are already caretaking these landscapes. And by providing that additional need that they have in terms of some funding, maybe because some of the family doesn't want to farm the property, um, actually, you can do a conservation easement and with the landowning family continuing to own it, um, there's the ability for them to continue to steward it in the way that the community has seen and obviously loved and enjoyed and treasured. Um, and then it is, as I mentioned, binding on the successive owners. And actually, we find that that can be probably the most challenging is when the land is sold out of the family's hands. That's when it's the most challenging for us as a land trust. 
to ensure that the land is continues to be conserved. Um, we've been very successful um, at continuing to defend all of our conservation easements. And um, but that can be one of the challenges that we face. Typically, the landowning family is good with the restrictions that they put on. So how exactly do we get to what is this value with respect to the conservation <clears throat> easement? Well, in order to look at that, the way that we do it is actually Utah Open Lands doesn't <clears throat> determine the value. We actually go out to an independent qualified appraiser. And that appraiser basically goes through <clears throat> a process that involves comparable sales. Um, it involves looking at market data and market analysis. And basically they look at the fair market value of the property before the conservation easement. <clears throat> they look at the fair market value after the conservation easement. So, <clears throat> excuse me, in this particular instance, the after value of the conservation easement might remain fairly high because they may have retained the ability to keep the house and to keep some other rights associated with it. But it's basically the difference between the before value and the value after that determine the fair market value of the conservation easement. And that is all done by an independent qualified conservation easement appraiser. Um, they are specifically certified to be able to do qualified conservation easement appraisals. So it's, it is different from just a simple fee title appraisal. So let's talk a little bit about landowner and family considerations and what some of the things are that you might be looking at when you're considering doing a conservation easement. Um, I want to stress the importance of why we started with talking about the bond language. And that is that, again, even though there are federal programs that have significant dollars that can be used for agricultural preservation and even ecological preservation and wetland preservation, which I have to say is absolutely amazing and tremendous. Having been doing this for 33 years, I remember watching other states other than Utah get a large chunk of those federal dollars because we just didn't have matching dollars as a state to basically take advantage of these great federal programs that are not only a way to fund a conservation easement, but the wealth of resource and expertise with the folks on these federal teams, whether it's with NRCS working through their agricultural land easement program, or even <clears throat> some of the stuff with the Department of Agriculture, where they're looking at soil and water optimization um, elements, all of those expertise are really, really great. But again, we started with the bond conversation because oftentimes you have to be able to have those matching dollars because funding a conservation easement is not as easy as it sounds. There's a lot of competition for those funds and land is expensive. And that makes it really tough to be able to fund some of these conservation easements. So part of the reason that I've brought up the purchased versus the donated conservation easement is because in almost every conservation funding program that I'm aware of, you get extra points, if not it being an actual requirement, that you make a partial donation of the conservation easement value. Now I wanna stress here, cause usually when I talk about this, people will say, wait a minute, I don't have millions of dollars in cash to make the percentage value contribution. We're not asking for cash. We're asking for the value of the conservation easement. So for example, um, one of the things that is really uh -huh. kind of amazing right now is the federal tax deduction. If you're a qualifying farmer or rancher, you can take 100% of your adjusted gross income for 16 years against the value of your gift. So it really allows you to maximize whatever potential percentage of gift you might make. And for a lot of these programs, and I know it's true for Wasatch County and Midway, they really look to the landowner to be contributing about 25% of the value. So if you went back to the $300,000 value that I had before, you'd be looking at 25% of that value would be what you would contribute and you wouldn't get cash for, and then the remaining amount you would. So on a, a million dollar, conservation easement, for example, 
uh, $250,000 of equivalent value is what you would not get as a landowner. Um, so that's one of the things to consider and to become familiar with is that there are some benefits. There are even some estate tax planning benefits that a lot of people don't necessarily talk about, um, but you actually can take an additional 40% off of that raw land value when you pass it on to your kids. Sometimes that can be a huge benefit for landowners. If you're not a qualifying farmer or rancher, you can take 50% of your adjusted gross income for 16 years against the value of the gift. So let's talk about actually getting your conservation easement funded. Again, you heard from the folks on the panel that leveraging is a huge, huge value that they are considering when they're looking at funding a particular um, property. And so there are different funding sources and some of those funding sources will have certain restrictions or certain requirements. So if you look at something like the NRCS program, they have an agricultural conservation easement, ALE, agricultural land easement program. They also have a resource conservation um, partnership program that allows for an even larger regional area. And there are lots of funds right now, especially through the Inflation Reduction Act that allow for some fundings to go towards these agricultural landscapes. But you absolutely have to be registered with the Farm Services Agency. Um, and that is something that I highly recommend to landowners that they go and talk to their local farm services agency person before they even approach the process of working through NRCS. When we did the <clears throat> Albert Kohler Legacy Farm, NRCS was a huge and pivotal partner in making sure that that project came to fruition. But we were constantly having to make sure that the landowners had visited with their farm services agency to keep all of that required data updated. <clears throat> and that's something that the land trust actually can't help you move through that process. We can be a cooperating entity with NRCS and work through that, but we can't we can't help you do the farm services agency process. And then there's the Lee Ray McAllister Fund, which is our state open space fund. It's really got a focus, as I mentioned, for working lands. Um, I think Jeremy Christensen is on the, the Zoom tonight and he's with the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food. Um, and he's he's one of those folks that can help you work through the process with respect to the Lee Ray McAllister funds. As Celeste, I think, mentioned, they really prefer that folks that come to their um, process are already working with uh, a certified land trust organization. And part of the benefit for that, I think, with some of these different funding requirements, is just that we can help go through the process and we can also help to bring some of those leveraging funds. When you look at the coal or dairy, we actually raise significant amount of money um, from private donors, uh, as well as some of the federal and the state um, contributions. So again, as I mentioned, a lot of times these uh, funding sources will require a 25% landowner contribution. Um, and oftentimes they will require that there's a 50% contribution to the actual dollars that they bring in. Um, in fact, I think that might be Leary McAllister's requirement is that they'll fund up to 50% of the project. But the other reason to look at leveraging and getting multiple partners involved and the fundraising aspect is all of these funds, regardless of how much money they have, there is gonna be a limit on how much money they can actually allocate to projects and there is a huge amount of interest. In fact, I think in this last round of the NRCS, I want to say they had something like $28 million in requests for limited funds. And so when that is the case, obviously you want to have as many things working in your favor as possible. So let's talk just briefly again about how this works from a bargain sale perspective. Um, because that's, I think, what most landowners will be looking at in terms of if you have a percentage of the um, easement that you are contributing. And so basically, you can see the machinations of the, the, the um, equation that I've gone through. Let's go back and just revisit that the conservation value determination has to happen first. We have to ensure that there are those conservation purposes. We have to ensure that the landowner uses are in harmony with those conservation purposes we're protecting. You have to have a qualified appraisal. 
<clears throat> you have to look at potential title issues. If there is a mortgage on the property, oftentimes it will not be able to qualify uh, either under the IRS guidelines or under some of these funding sources. And as you get through a process with some of these federal funding sources, that becomes a huge issue in terms of making sure that there's access, making sure that there aren't encumbrances on the title to the land that would forestall or frustrate actually putting a conservation easement on it. So as you can see in this value where I've made up a million dollar conservation or a million dollar value of a piece of property, I've said that the conservation easement value is 650,000. There is no set percentage. I'm just giving you those percentages so you can, can see that. Um, that 650 ends up representing essentially the value of the development rights for lack of a better way of explaining it. And then the bargain sale value <clears throat> being 487, uh, $1,000 because we're asking the landowner to make a partial gift. So the 75% and the 25% are coming out of that $650,000 value. So again, that 165,000 would not be an actual cash con contribution that the landowner would be making. That's coming as a percentage out of that easement value. Um, and so just basically kind of some of the things that you can anticipate um, seeing um, when this goes forward is working with an entity. Um, you typically have to have some sort of signed letter of intent or purchase agreement for a conservation easement. Oftentimes that's required by these funding sources. Um, you probably want to see about initiating an appraisal, but you have to be concerned about timing of the appraisal. I can certainly speak to that. We can answer some questions on that. So it's either that signed letter of intent or a purchase agreement. You need to do the due diligence. In some instances, we end up having to get a survey if there are boundary line disputes. There's grant writing that will go into it. There's the title work I mentioned. And then the conservation easement holder or the land trust organization will work with you on drafting the easement language. And then also a key component is basically getting a snapshot of the property by doing a baseline documentation. <clears throat> Typically, after some fundraising, there's the closing, the easement is signed, recorded, and the landowner is paid. Um, after that, some of the things that landowners need to consider <clears throat> is they need to make sure to notice the county assessor that they've placed a conservation easement on the property. If they're under green belt, there is the conservation easement rollback relief where you can take it out of green belt and not be penalized for the rollback taxes. However, you do, if you wanna keep your land in agriculture, you need to make sure to re-enroll because the conservation easement will affect essentially kind of a change in ownership, even though you're still owning it, that is gonna trigger that element. So you wanna make sure you work with the county assessor um, and make sure that you are reapplying for Greenbelt if that is necessary. Um, and then from a property tax perspective, um, there are, uh, uh, laws on the books. In fact, um, former Senator John Valentine from Utah County actually worked um, to provide the recognition that when you have a conservation easement on it, there's a diminution of value. So with that, I'm going to pretty much um, stop my um, presentation. I know that we have some wonderful words we're going to hear from um, the commissioner Basically, the role of the land trust at the end of the day is to be the st a steward with you. And it's an ongoing relationship we, we have with the landowners. It's actually one of the most enjoyable parts of my job is this continued relationship with the landowners, helping you in any way we can, finding other funding sources, whether it's a county or a city or a landowner for you know, water improvements um, or restoration or fencing even. Those are things that we want to become a constant partner in. And our fundamental goal is to forever defend and protect the land from development, honoring the vision and the gift that you end up um, participating in either as a funder or as a landowner in one of these processes. So um, with that, that is the end of my presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If I can here and um, turn the time back over to you, John, as I think you're going to facilitate any questions and answers. Hey, um, we're going to have a Q&A for 10 or 15 minutes and then uh, Gordon will finish this off uh, if we're not already 
finished off. No. <laughs> and uh, I, so if you have a card with a question on it, would you pass it this way and give it to Josh or pass it this way and give it to Merit? And then they'll bring them down here and I can choose between them. We do have, um, um, we do have a question online that I think is pertinent, especially for Wendy. And that is, uh, the person asks, uh, this is from, this. They, they ask, where else have conservation uh, bonds been passed? other than in Wasatch and Summit counties. Are there other places in the state where there have been good, uh, and especially in Utah County, have there any good bonds been passed in Utah County? Uh, there have not been any bonds that I am aware of um, that were passed in Utah County. Um, Draper City passed an open space bond. Um, Salt Lake County passed an open space bond. Salt Lake City passed an open space bond. Cache County has passed an open space bond. So it's not just Summit and Wasatch counties and Midway City that have passed open space bonds in Park City. There are a number of communities throughout the state that have that have passed open space bonds. Okay, uh, thank you. I have a, another question of my own and then we'll get these written questions and, and go to them. There's a couple more online also, but um, the situation in um, Park City is similar to the situation in Utah County in that there are urban areas and then there are agricultural areas outside these. Um, the problem that I uh, estimate in some of these places like Spanish Fork and Payson is that there's such a suburban or even almost urban area that the, the people who vote in the city council are urbanites, not ag people. And so it's hard to get a representative on the city council who would help you facilitate passing a bond. And so I wonder what this committee would, uh, you know, Celeste and the others would have to say about what do you do in that situation when they, where you don't have an advocate on the city council? First of all, our city council did not have a single farmer on it. So um, one was, you know, uh, one came from a farming family. A couple of us are transplants. We moved here because we love this rural community. We wanted out of the big city. Um, and I don't know that being a farmer necessarily means you're an advocate for open space. And in fact, I think a lot of our farmers um, on that first bond voted no. I think they have a concern and a fear of government involvement. Um, and so I think those things all had to be addressed. And, and I think they had to see, like Heinrich referred to in, in their county, they had to see that it works. They had to see that we would be stewards and that it would be optional. There's no coercion. This is not a condemnation. This is an opportunity. And um, I, I'm one of those that tries to tried to shout from the rooftops, I'm just trying to give you a choice. You, you know, so many of our farmers wanted to keep their farm, but they couldn't afford to, and so they sold to a developer. For the first time ever, they had a choice. And that was something that resonated with them. And I will tell you that I worked with the previous government in uh, the previous mayor and trying to facilitate getting a bond on a ballot. And that was not something she nor her council were interested in pursuing. And so I said that I'm going to run for mayor because I think this community does want this. And um, so I so I, I think we need to be careful in labeling who's going to be an open space advocate and who isn't. Okay. I think I think how you frame it's really important too because uh, you know people in the community council members or just citizens at large may not care about the environment they may not care about recreation those might not be priorities for them but something I find fairly universal is people care about their community character. 
they don't take pride in their straw. They take it pride in the people and the landscape that's around them. And whether that landscape's pastures or desert or mountains or lakes or rivers, it's part of their character that they want to see preserved and protected. And it's part of what defines their community. You want to have natural boundaries between your community and the surrounding communities to, to protect that identity and uniqueness. And so sometimes it's a matter of how you frame what you're trying to accomplish uh, to broaden that audience. Okay, uh, th thank you. Um, here's another question online, and then we'll go to some of these from the audience. Uh, does Utah open lands work with conservation buyers when farmers, ranchers want to sell their land, not just the conservation? Uh, do you work with, there would have to be a bond in place for that to happen, but, you know, to outright buy them instead of just selling the conservation no, we, we, so, so let me just define the question a little bit more. I think that part of what the person is asking is um, something that we typically call either a conservation buyer or a conservation investor. And that is somebody who typically is pretty wealthy and can benefit from the tax consequences or the tax benefits, I should say, of uh, donating a conservation easement. And so in those particular instances, we have and I will tell you that COVID brought to Utah and lands a lot more conservation buyers than I'd ever seen in the 33 years that I had been doing Utah open lands. And a conservation buyer basically is someone who will come in, they buy the piece of property, and then they place a conservation easement on it that protects it forever. Um, they buy it outright from the landowning family. And then they take the tax deduction benefits. So you don't necessarily have to have a bond in order to do that. And in some instances, those conservation buyers oftentimes like to lease back to the landowning family the ability to continue farming so long as that family wants to do it, because oftentimes what they're interested in is that agricultural um, landscape. So yes, we do work with conservation buyers. Hey, thank you. Um... Is agritourism an extreme use for land to be considered for a conservation easement? I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that exactly. Is agritourism... Is that a qualified uh, use of the land for a conservation easement? Not, it, uh, you know, not farming, but agritourism. Yeah, agritourism. And I think, um, you know, Celeste could speak to this as well. Um, but certainly, you know, some of what the Kohler family does in order to sustain their agricultural um, dairy operation, aside from having just killer artisan cheese, you know, they'll have a tractor day or they'll have a, a pumpkin patch day or a, a corn maze or something like that. Um, I think that we all recognize and I, I really think that the Department of Agriculture and Food um, has really tried to buoy up and support that agriculture tourism as really part of the lifeline that farmers and ranchers are looking at down the road to sustain some of their vital agricultural operations that actually feed us. So we like to go be tourists there, but that all helps to sustain the fact that they're going to actually be able to provide us with food. Celeste, did you want to add anything to that? Only that they, um, the, the Kohler Jerry, they also um, have field trips. So I don't know how many thousands of school children come through that dairy every year um, on a field trip to see how, where does their milk come from? Where does their cheese come from? It's huge. Yeah. Thank you. Do conservation easements ever contain language restricting land uses beyond development? I think you spoke to this, but this, the following question is more specific. Meaning, do the conservation uh, documents restrict types of agricultural practice? For example, could a farm switch from a cow-calf operation to uh, a hay operation, out of the hay operation? Well, that's an excellent question and a nuanced question, and I, I appreciate it. Certainly, um, there are two, uh, to answer it, I'll use uh, an example of there are two programs 
um, that are uh, specific to the NRCS Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. One of them is landscapes that qualify for what is considered grasslands of special significance. And that is really kind of working lands for wildlife. It's landscapes that help also prote protect habitat for maybe sage grouse um, or other wildlife species. And the benefits are that it is rangeland. And in those particular instances, you can't then go and turn those lands into cropped lands in most instances. But for the most part, conservation easements don't typically regulate um, what the agricultural producer is going to need to do in order to remain sustainable and sufficient. Um, there may be, there are, you know, certain restrictions like you typically can't have a feedlot. So, you know, there isn't the AFO CAFO issues, you know, typically there's not going to be funding available for that. It usually doesn't pass some of the, the conservation purposes. But typically, if you want to change from a cow calf operation to a sheep operation or to do, you know, uh, more, uh, you know, vegetables and that sort of thing, I think what becomes key in those conservation easements is if you are going to start doing a lot more um, produce that you're going to be growing or more of a maybe a community supported agricultural pursuit. Um, then you might want to think about have you provided for temporary structures like greenhouses or hoop houses or things like that in the terms of the conservation easement so you can make that transition so the question basically no we won't really uh change you, you know have guidance over the uses but there may be other things built within the framework of the conservation easement that again you want to really do the visioning out front to make sure that you're not restricting yourself in kind of an unnecessary way. Thank you. I, I think we have time for three more questions and then we'll um, turn it over to Brandon. Uh, on a conservation easement, does the land need to be upkept? Like a farm, does it always need to be farmed? And, and I think that that question has already been answered. The, the part that is new is who enforces that? And you mentioned earlier that you helped enforce that, but uh, the question online new, uh, expands it a little bit. Speaks, please speak to how the enforcement works. What if the terms of easement are not held to? Has that ever happened? So that is a good question. And, and actually, um, in most of our conservation easements, because we think the open space is really a critical component, we try to put multiple conservation purposes so that in the event that agriculture no longer can occur on the property, it still has other conservation values. It's still going to be habitat for wildlife. It's still going to be a beautiful field to look over for the most part. You typically, if you have an agricultural piece of property, the water rights are tied to that continued agricultural use. We don't own the water rights rights, but we do have the right to enforce those being applied to the property. That is actually part of the value that you get paid for in the development value, right? If you don't have water, you can't do the development. So the water does come along and be part of that beneficial use of the conservation easement. There are issues when it comes to some of the funding sources like NRCS that the that the federal government wants to see those lands continue to be farmed. And in so those in those particular instances, there are several things that we look at. We don't want to look at it as much as enforcement, as much as um, making sure that we have ways to bring it back into a compliance. And to that end, you know, one of the things that I know the Department of Agriculture has, and Food has talked about is how do we gear up some of these young farmers? There are actually a lot of young farmers that don't have the ability to purchase a piece of property. But that's what we would look to first in terms of enforcement, less enforcement and more, let's find a new partner to help this land continue to be the sustaining agricultural property that it is. Because I think Celeste said, I actually don't think agriculture, I don't think the need to feed ourselves is going anywhere. So I do think that you're going to continue to see people who are interested in pursuing agriculture. Um, we certainly see that with the increase, the wild increase in urban farming that people are looking at. So ultimately, we would try to find another partner that could come in and lease part of the property to, to keep it upkeep in agriculture. 
Thank you. There's an online question and, uh, and a, a card question that are really the same thing, which is you've been mostly talking about huge areas like Bonanza Flats and this huge farms that you, uh, but uh, many of the success stories are large, expansive areas. My city is rapidly approaching build out. Are there good examples of smaller, semi urban pockets being preserved? And then the online question adds kind of an acre value, like 10 acres or 50 acres. Yeah, there, there are great examples. I know Heinrich could talk a little bit about kind of some of the, the pocket parks. You could talk about Willow Ranch. Utah Open Lands worked with Salt Lake City to protect a, a three acre, um, really urban nature park called Hidden Hollow in the Sugar House District. Um, Parley's Creek runs through it. Um, it is It is definitely something that has paid dividends unbelievably in terms of it being one of those favorite places. Sugar House is a hot place to live in part because of things like Hidden Hollow. So it doesn't necessarily have to be huge. Again, it comes down to what are you gonna have the purpose for it? I don't know, Heinrich, if you wanna jump in. Yeah, no, Wendy, I, I would say, um, you know, yeah, some of the pocket parks in like Lower Main Street, you know, green spaces, we, we uh, in Park City, there's, you know, some, some legacy mining historic sites, right? So not big pieces of property, but very important to our community where there's historic aspects that are, you know, an acre or so um, in size. So it's, it's really like Wendy's saying, it's the values associated with that conservation easement, which aren't always large tracts of land. And that usually typically falls under what we call a clearly delineated government conservation policy just because I like those terms. Great, okay, here's the last question. If you look at the room, there's plenty of interest in conservation easements among us local farmers, but very limited public funding opportunities, e.g. everyone wants financing from the Leeway McAllister Fund, but there's not enough to go around. How can we be assured we won't have to wait 10 to 20 years for funding when there are developers pounding down our doors to develop our properties. Yay, whoever asked that question. Just thank you. Um, I've been doing this for 33 years and I have been hoping that farmers and ranchers will call their elected officials, that they will call their legislators. Um, we as a state are missing out on some federal funds because we don't have a dedicated source of funding. The Leroy McAllister Fund, because I was there, was supposed to be an ongoing dedicated source of funds. We're looking for leadership and we're looking for vision to sustain our communities. And bonds are definitely one way to do that. But certainly right now, we are on the cusp of the legislative session and you need to let your legislators know that this is important. Because if we don't start today, we don't start tomorrow, we don't start this session to find some possible funding and leveraging opportunities, the reality is, yeah, we're gonna we're just gonna kick the can down the road and, and we're gonna be waiting longer and longer. And so it takes the community. There's not just one voice. It's not gonna just be Utah Open Lands. It's not gonna be just, you know, the success stories that we have out there. I get phone calls every day and it breaks my heart that I can't provide the funding for it. But when you look at how much money a state like Colorado has that they're putting into open space preservation on a dedicated or Michigan, you realize that the more we can have an ongoing dedicated source of funding and the more we can match it in our communities, the more we have the ability to take advantage of some of these federal funds. And so my call to action would be you really need to let your electeds know that this is an important thing to you and i can guarantee you which again is one of the reasons that i was really pleased to have our panel here tonight these folks these elected officials these people who are working day in and day out on open space in their communities they know how valuable these dedicated sources of funding have been in changing the roadmap for their community. And as Andy said, ensuring community character that was really important to the reason that we call these places home. And so really what I would urge is, is the more, even if it's a small amount, if we can 
get it to be dedicated on a regular basis, then we will find that we will be able to go out and find some funding. So that's what I would urge in terms of, of those of you who are there tonight. Make sure that your elected officials, make sure your representatives and, and folks at the state legislature know how much you care about seeing the Leroy McAllister uh, Fund funded and funded on an ongoing basis. That's a place to start. Can I add something real quickly to that? Just because I'm also on the... Um... I think because of our experience up here in Midway, I, I was asked to be on the land conservation board for the state, which is who um, divvies up those Lee Ray McAllister funds. And it's been fascinating <coughs> to learn a little bit more to Wendy's point. <coughs> Excuse me. To Wendy's point, we, this board has supplied our state legislatures with a list of lands that want to be conserved because our legislators truly did not understand this is real, that, they, that there are more farms that want to be preserved than there are funds to preserve them. <coughs> so yes, please contact your legislators. Um, I would add to that question to that statement, one really short thing, and then uh, Brandon will finish. And when Brandon's done, we're done. And so the if you have uh, a disease in your herd, you're going to call a vet. If you have someone trying to steal your water rights, you're going to call a lawyer. And here it, on the back of your uh, agenda, if you didn't get one, you, there's some more here. It gives Wendy's contact information and some other information for other entities you could contact for help with conservation easements. It's clear that you cannot set up a conservation easement on your own. And if you're anxious about developers on your back, then get started today. Get started tomorrow by contacting Wendy. And that's all I have to say. So Brandon, you're going to... Uh, Hit the home run and calls. Oh, and geez, I, I didn't mean to say that. That's, that's a lot of no. That's a lot of pressure in Spanish court because, as our good mayor Mendenhall says, we hit singles in oh, Spanish okay. court, and then they they accumulate into runs, and so that's how you win baseball games, right, Mayor? So uh, that excuse, Mayor Sakovich, he wanted to be here, but he's experiencing some health issues, and so I know uh, originally he was going to be here. So uh, excuse him, and uh, and then just wanted to say, Mayor Johnson and Mayor Beerman. Um, I've, I've watched you from afar. I've, I've quoted Mayor Johnson several times on the Kohler Farm as she's presented in the League of Cities and Towns uh, as, a, as I was a young city councilman. And so I, um, I've watched you too and, and uh, what you've done in your communities. And so appreciate you being with us tonight. So thank you, thank you. I think the reason we're here today is, is really, um, you know, I, I, I get a lot of questions as an elected official, many of which, you know, are, you know, about land, right? Preserving land. And what what all the growth, right? Growth is a huge conversation. And one of the last questions, right, to talk to your legislators. The legislators are they're getting pounded with what about housing, housing, housing this year, right? And then and then, you know, we're gonna pound them with, well, what about land and land and, and farming, right? And and those types of questions. So it is difficult to be a land official and and uh over a decade, 12 years of doing this, it's been interesting. Um, I was a city councilman here in Spanish Fork before I'm now the uh, county commissioner for Utah County. And, and uh, you have landowners that say, get out of my way. I want to develop. This is my right. Like, uh, owning land, owning land is, is I believe, what the our forefathers that uh, they formed the Constitution, um, what they wanted us to you know, to do his own land. And, 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 uh, and I think that's a, a great right. And, and so as, as we have these conversations, I'm, I'm, I don't have anybody actively asking me how to, how to preserve their farm. And so I was grateful that we were able to bridge this gap and bring information to many landowners that are here and online and many mayors to, to have a better understanding for maybe a tool that, that might work for, for you. Um, if you are a landowner and uh, or an elected official, and uh, one of the things that uh, my dad called me today, and uh, if you don't know my dad, he's in my opinion a legend. He's he's just one of the greatest greatest uh, 
farmers of, of Utah County here in the Spanish Fork area. We manage the Intermountain Farmers IFA here for four, over 40 years and, and continues to farm out in uh, Lakeshore. And uh, he called me today and he said, do you mind telling one story? And I said, yeah. And he says, the reason you're not qualified to do this is not just because you're an elected official and you drive an electric car brand. And he reminded me that uh, the reason he says, he says, why do you care? Why do you, why do you want to keep doing the farmer's market on Saturdays? It's a pain in the butt. And I call you, you got to come down, you got to pick sweet corn, you got to pick up the squash and all these things. And, and uh, you know, he's asking me these questions. And, I, and he says, do you remember when you were like 11 years old? And I said, where are you going with this? And he says, so it was a Spanish Fork Fiesta Day celebration. And, and he asked me to stay home from the parade, which is a big deal to not go to the Spanish Fork Fiesta Day's parade. So I, I agreed. I stayed home to help him. And, uh, and he had a water turn and, and he was irrigating between, uh, you know, different pieces of ground and he watered full pieces of alfalfa and asked me to go light the ridge on fire between those two pieces of alfalfa. And me, uh, I hopped on my four wheeler, I drove down, I lit it on fire and was driving back and I see him waving at me and I'm like, Dad, what, what, what are you waving at? And I turned around and I had lit the wrong ridge on fire <laughs> and the barley was, was ahead and oh, it was on fire. And he calls it the miracle of 1988 because the winds turned and it literally, we were able to get it out and didn't burn up all the crops. So he, he made me promise I would share that story with you because I'm I'm not quite as qualified as you like <laughs> to be here as, as his least likely son to take over the farm. But, but I share that with you because the reality is we had a conversation today of, um, he had spoke with my oldest brother that lives in Colorado and he's a home builder. And he says, how is your business? And he says, I am so busy building huge homes. And the buyers of these and the builders are kids of the farmers who live very conservatively, right? They live very, very frugal, but now have a lot of money. And I'm building them two and three and $4 million homes in Colorado. And so it was unique because my dad is bringing all these things up because He's like, I don't have all the answers, but I would really love you to continue doing what we do out here. And we've gotten into some of the agritourism. My nephew mainly does all that. And, and that helps bridge the gap between, you know, funding, because we all know that if you were going to go out and try and really profit farming, it's difficult, but it, it can be done. It's just, it's just a little different nowadays, right? There are many, many challenges. Um, like I, I mentioned, I don't have anybody really actively talking to me like, hey, Commissioner Gordon, I want to preserve my farm. And so tonight I wanted to, you know, maybe we'll spark, maybe we'll spark some interest in landowners. Maybe that conversation could happen. I have so many questions. I mean, I wrote papers and papers and a lot of questions later for Wendy and, and for others, uh, you know, of how so much of this, you know, can be done. There's there's much of, um, there, there's so many options from general obligation bonds to, you know, bonding. Should it be done in the city? Should it be done in the county? Should it be partnering? So all of these questions that I've written down, I have answer, uh, you know, not, don't have answers for, but I, there are challenges. And I know there, there may be challenges for you as landowners or citizens, wherever you are, and, and just cannot reiterate enough that just getting in the room and having the conversation about it if it works, if it doesn't work for you, at least you know you have options and your tools as well. And so um, that's really all that I kind of had. I don't have, I wish I had a better vision and a future for Utah County as we're going, but we don't have any funding plans. We don't have anything on the docket, but my hope is that we can further conversations and make sure we're headed in a direction that might help. Before Kay takes the last word, I thought I was giving it to you, but she's insisting. She too. So it's don't ruin your children's lives by giving them a million dollar home in Colorado. <laughs> that will ruin them quicker than anything you could do to them. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is there are conservation easements that have taken place in Utah County. There are at least four landowners on the shore of uh, Utah Lake in Provo that they're working with the Nature Conservancy. I was out there a couple of years ago and we walked the properties. And so those are still being worked on. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is part of our goal from the Conserve Utah Valley is to educate. 
And meetings like this is where it starts. And you might, everything you hear might not bring, you know, something that you that you want to hear, but hopefully there are some bits and pieces and some motivation for you. The, the goal to talk to legislators is key. We helped last year get Bridalville Falls into a, in a state monument status. Um, we didn't want it in a state park status because that would mean that people would have to pay to go there and we wanted to keep it free. So we worked with Representative Kevin Stratton and he got it uh, passed where it's in state monument status. So you can make things happen. It's just that you have to work together with the right people and ask the right questions and just be persistent at it. So we just really appreciate you all coming. We appreciate everyone who was a part of the panel. These are people that we have picked their brains the last couple of years because they've done amazing things in some in Washington County. And so we want to replicate that here in Utah County. So we just got to keep doing it together. So thank you. And please drive home safely. Can we give a round of applause to our panelists?